Um, Tuesday at 7.30 a.m. we have men's Bible study downstairs. And Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock, is the Bible study on Zoom. And the same message goes out. If you're not on and you'd like to be on, we have a good time. We, you know, we, John really challenges us. Usually it's only a couple verses that we're looking at, but you know, we're really going in depth on them. So if you want to be on, if you'd like to try it, I mean, especially you're thinking now it's getting dark at you know, 5 o'clock. Soon it'll be 3 o'clock. Yeah. Seems that way. So uh, 6 o'clock in the evening is a good time to settle down and just give John your email address and we can take care of that. Friday, this Friday at 8 a.m. is a good shepherd pick up in Hamden. Volunteers needed here at the church at 8.30 to help unload. Saturday, next Saturday, October 2nd at the Eastbrook Baptist Church, they're hosting a Defending the Faith Conference faith conference with Travis Pelletier. He'll be speaking on who is Jesus Christ. And that's from 9.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. Saturday, October 16th is Women's B&B, &B, and I'm going to assume you're studying Ruth, not at Ruth's house. Okay? It's probably going to be at my house at 9 o'clock. Okay, well that'll be, we've got a couple weeks still Absolutely. on that. So, anyways, just for future reference. And on that Sunday, the 17th, there will be a potluck fellowship luncheon after the church service. Uh, as a reminder, Samaritan's Purse, we're always looking for donations. There's no pictures in the bulletin this week, but um, you know, there's certainly a need, even if it's only money for shipping. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Peter. Who is, uh Responsible for the donations? Ruth. 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 Okay. Well, Pete, the financial donations? Yes. Yeah. That would be me. Okay. Yes. Okay. First of all, we've got uh, items downstairs from Canada this weekend. There's some sandwiches and salads. Mm -hmm. The other thing, which I wish I was going to be able to go to the thing down at Eastbrook, but I'm not going to be able to because. We have the Historical Society Pumpkin Sale and Cornstock Sale the same day, and it's from 10 to 4 o'clock. Um, we will have free cookies and cider for anybody who wants to come, and the house will be open. The um, Historical Center will be open for anybody who wants to go through. And um, I guess that's it. And I'm going to hang this up up there so anybody wants to look at it. But it's an open house. Okay. Hopefully, Travis will be having another conference. Excuse me? Downstairs? <laughs> no, oh, you mean the bad joke. Oh, I know it was a long yogurt. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Any other that announcements one? that I missed or that weren't included in the bulletin? Morning, all. This morning psalm I will read entirely. I will not miss the second page this morning. Like I no, last no. Time. So that, and I even verified there are seven. And this is what I'm reading. The psalm of David. O oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen against me, ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. Amen. Amen. Because of the weather this morning, um, I've picked a chorus to sing. 
Um, so we'll sing it before we stand. And I, hopefully most of you know it. Heavenly Sunshine. Yes. <laughs> hymnals to, we're going to sing three songs here, uh, 86, 87, and 88. Uh, we'll do 86 twice, so let's stand together. I'll, I'll read the intro. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, oh, oh. 
Father, as we are here this morning, we pray that by your grace and mercy, again, as we do each Lord's Day, that you would give us your grace, and that you would continually show us that mercy, that you would bring us in closer fellowship with you. For, well, Father, we have you to worship and none other. You are above all things. And we worship you through your Son, Jesus Christ, by the presence of your Spirit. Father, this morning as we're here worshiping, remind us of the words of Jesus. Remind us of the life that was given on our behalf. Remind us that it was Him who sacrificed all things. And it was in your giving of these things that we now have redemption and fellowship and communion with you. Father, you are our God. And we worship you as our God. This morning, as we remind ourselves, it was the words that Jesus taught us to pray that say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our catechism this morning, found in your bulletin, is taken from Philippians 4, verse 6. And the question is, with what attitude should we pray? With God perseverance and gratefulness in humble submission to God's will, knowing that for the sake of Christ, He always hears our prayers. Uh, Tina's not here this morning. Are there any missions, moments, anything, Ruth or Candy? No? Okay. Uh, at this time, if our ushers will come forward to receive our morning offering. Thank <laughs>
Father, we lift up these gifts to you because they are what we have. And they are small compared to anything, to all things that you have given us. And Father, is there anything truly that we can give you because all things belong to you? But Father, this is our worship, thanking you and bringing into the storehouse. Father, this is our way of worshiping you, to say that you are our God. Father, bless us now. Bless the gift. Bless the giver. Father, not because of who we are and what we've done, but because of what you do. Because all creation belongs to you. Father, this morning we lift up these prayers. We lift up these gifts to you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Our responsive reading this morning, found in your bulletin, is taken from the book of Mark, verses 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What would be the session on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he said to them, child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child of my name, receives me, and whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. This morning as we come to this time of prayer, just a few things that I'd like to remind you of. This week we are praying for the Lemoyne Baptist Church. Um, David Fox, who has been here on an occasion or two, uh, some of you may remember and know. Uh, David is uh, actually, yes, he's a distant relative of the Marshes. Um, she comes from those foxes and bulls up there, all those other animals up in the county. <laughs> and uh, Dave is a uh, Doing a good job and has been filling in for a while now. So we would pray this week in the East Association for Lemoyne. Keep them in your prayer. He is only an interim and he's been doing a long time interim. Because, well, first of all, the short time before and then COVID hit. And he's hanging in here and they've asked him to stay for a while. So pray for that church too. They've had to make some decisions because of some things that have happened. And the church is... Uh, is, is struggling in some way, so keep them in prayer. Barb? My sister was coming up in Pennsylvania, and her way up, she got severe abdominal pain, called my sister, said she had thought she'd have appendicitis, made it to West Virginia, they took her to the emergency room, they found a large mass in her abdomen. So we would pray for her. She can't be seen by the doctor, he's gone until Thursday. Okay. And your sister's name? Sharon. Sharon. Not wise. <laughs> I know. It's easy, it's easy. Anyway, so we'll pray for Barb's sister Sharon. Anyone else this morning? Her? I got to pray. I got my brother up at 15 again. He claimed to the Christian that he had the Lord. He didn't want to come to church. I guess he found out he was preaching. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's still good to see Good to see him. Yes, yes. Um, for some of us, and for some of you who don't know, maybe you do know, uh, Deb and I were in the county yesterday as uh, I did the funeral for her uncle, Floyd, who was very close to us as a family and very close to me even. I, I was his pastor for five and a half years up in, in Stockholm, so it was a touching time of seeing relatives and people, and believe it or not, uh, the funeral home was, was quite proud. He was well-known, well-liked. So we had a good time up there, and people were 
just like everywhere else, trying to be cautious and trying to be respectful and trying to be crazy and all those other things. At the same time, uh, we just did our. We, I told them, we're doing our thing like we were at Clifton, and that's it. But uh, we were blessed with the traveling mercies, so we thank the Lord for that also. And there are others who are traveling today. Tina Teen and Gary, of course, for those who don't know, are in Chicago, and uh, they will hopefully be back to, I don't know, tonight, or if somebody know they're in the office, they come back tonight? I believe so, because she's yeah. got school. Yeah, she's got school, got to work. So anyway, I was teasing Dave this morning. I did say, I forgot to tell you that we canceled church because of the rain. Uh, but all jokes aside, the days are coming when the snow will start flying again. And we just hope that we get good weather. I, you know, some years it comes and comes. And, there, you know, he, and the Bible says he rains on the just and the unjust. So don't worry, you're going to get your rain too. You know, but we'll see. Any other joys or concerns this morning before we go to prayer? None. Well, let's go to prayer. Let the crew lead us, as I like to say. And we ask a blessing. If you feel like praying, pray, and then I will close. Let's go. Father, as we come to you this morning as a Clifton United Baptist Church, we're just a little church here on the airline, and we align ourselves with your word the best we can, and there's nothing that makes us special except that we are attempting each and every day, working on our salvation in fear and trembling to belong to you. Father, asked us and we mentioned it this morning in the catechism that we come to you in prayer but a prayer with love well the only reason we know love is because you first loved us your word tells us that and it's it's clear but you asked us to to come 
with perseverance, plodding through it, and again, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, staying true to the faith, as Herb's already prayed from Ephesians, Father, standing as we need to stand. It's that perseverance that's going to keep us standing with you, standing in the gap, being faithful to you and your word. Father, we need to be grateful. Grateful for all that you've provided. And when things seem tough, we need to look around and remember all the things we've been given. Father, I like to quote Dick so often when we mention the song, counting your blessings one by one, and Dick says, ton by ton. And yes, Father, we need to come to you with gratefulness. Being grateful for how much you have given us. But Father, you've never really withheld anything that we are aware of. You provide, and you provide, and you provide. You giveth, and you giveth, and you giveth again, and you are our God. We need to be grateful for all that you do for us. But Father, we need to be humble. And we need to submit to you. Jesus said we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and the Lord Jesus reminded us that we need to teach them to obey all things that he has commanded. We know it's required of us to love one another. Father, sometimes that's hard. It's hard to love them others the way we want to love them. And I know it's hard for others to love us the way we want to be loved. Father, forgive us for our shortcomings and when we fall short of being the people you want us to be. We know you hear our prayers because of what was completed on the cross in your son's sacrifice for each and every one of us. And Father, we pray that today it's the blood that covers us. The blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood that protects us. And if there's any power we have in this world, it's in the blood and not in us. So Father, as we're here this morning, to meet is the church. The church, even if we said without a name, we're here to worship the God who has given us all things through the power of the cross. And his son Jesus Christ. We lift up your name today and worship you. And we pray these things again in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's turn our hymnals to number 372. Our God reigns. We stand and sing together. 372.
for singing so well as you did. This morning we are in verses 6 to 16 of the first chapter of Jonah. You know, Jonah was a guy who went to Nineveh High School and had a whale of a time. I thought Bob would appreciate that. I learned that when I was a kid. Don't quit my day job. Okay, all right, I won't quit my day job. So while he was having a whale of a time at Nineveh High School, uh, he learned a lot of things. And this morning we're going to finish up this first chapter, and I'm going to read through for you. So we're in Jonah 1, and remember for those who are a little lost, Jonah is being behind Obadiah, and just before that wonderful book of Micah. I, I was looking at the page numbers, and I, I said, well, I don't know why. Your Bible's going to be different anyhow. So, Vern used to do that for me. Vern used to tell me what page number, if you had a pew Bible. 967, for those who are hard of seeing, hearing, I mean, whatever. <laughs> Verses 6 to 16, Jonah 1. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Job. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you? that the sea may quiet down for us. For the sea grew more and more temptuous. He said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And we'll stop there for today. Let's speak to the Father for a moment, if we may. Heavenly Father, we again ask your grace and mercy. Ask for your, we ask for your presence, for your spirit to speak to us. Open our eyes that we may see. Give us something fresh, something new. Father, please we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning I want to speak about, or talk to you about two things that seem to kind of jump out from the text. And one is checking our hearing, and the other one is checking our eyesight. And I think it's important to understand, to, to get this thing going, go back to verse 5 for a moment. In verse 5, then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. This verse 5 tells us that Jonah had gone deep into the hole of the ship and was in Never Never Land. Fast asleep. So often we have an opportunity to listen to what's happening around us and even play an important part in making a change for the kingdom of God, but we're sleeping. We have a chance to communicate what God has sent us to communicate, but we're, we're sleeping. We're more consumed with our comfort. 
I can't imagine. Debbie and I went down to uh, Castine when the the replica from Columbus's ship was there, and uh, we got on the ship, and the floor is shaped like this. And the captain's quarters is the only place it looked like you'd get some stability. Outside of that, if you're a sailor, if you're anything below the captain, you were like in this little wooden boat, and they didn't have a they didn't have a wheel. Because in those days, the wheel hadn't been invented for the ship yet. So they had a rudder that went on a pulley system of ropes. And these men would pull that pulley back and forth. And you can imagine the beating of the sea and what it would be like to be on that little boat. That little ship. That was a huge ship in your time. But I can't imagine where you would go in the corner of that thing if you were in a bad storm. And here we're going back thousands of years before this little boat sailed from Spain. And Jonah was so comfortable wherever he was down in the hole of this ship that he was asleep. Do we ever get that comfortable with the world around us? That as believers we fall asleep? That we're not concerned with the, the, the things? I had the opportunity yesterday, as I told you, to preach, uh, and I did. I preached at this funeral, and I, I love it. I get the opportunity every time I, 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 I take it, every time I get it, to, to tell the story of Lazarus. Every time I have, there's a funeral, there's a celebration of life, there's a memorial, there's a passing, asking that wonderful question that Jesus asked Martha when he reminded her that he was the resurrection and the life. And he asked that really pointed question. Do you believe this? Uh -oh. And I reminded people that in church, or we weren't in church actually, we were at the funeral home, and it was a crowded funeral home, that no matter what you hear, what you believe, prior to that, we looking at somebody who had faith, and as Christians, we celebrate the life that's been given to us, and the new tent that we take on when we die in this, Jesus said, I am that resurrection and life. Do you believe this? And there's people there that I know won't believe that. Don't have a clue about it. They're probably thinking when I'm talking, how long is this fat guy going to take? Boys, I hope he gets done real soon. He hasn't told enough jokes to keep me awake. What am I going to do? I'm just trying to get through this. And you're not listening to the conversation. And the conversation is, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And when he looks at Martha and he looks her in the eye, he says, do you believe this? What started that whole conversation was, remember, she said to Jesus, well, if you had been here. And I really wanted to chai somebody, and I don't want to go there this morning, so you can get upset at me and tell me at the back door or when you're leaving, and I'll forgive you. But I, I don't care how many shots and in injections you get or don't get. I don't care what you do to make yourself better in this life. The problem is that when we close our eyes in this life, the last time will we stand before the resurrection and the life of Jesus Christ. Will we stand before the Father? And Jesus asked the question, do you believe this? Are we accepting Christ? And I, I'm not talking about just praying a prayer. Oh Lord Jesus, come into my heart and help me today. I, people do that all the time and to me it means nothing. In fact, I put a post on Facebook this week and I never do that. Somebody gave me a wonderful post and I put it on there and said, if not everybody sitting in church is a Christian. Not everybody sitting in jail is a citizen, is a criminal. And not everybody who gets in your face is your friend. People can tell you anything. But Jesus looked at Mark and said, do you believe this? That I am the resurrection and the life. And this is the message that... Not about Jesus, but what God told them if they repented that Jonah was given to take to Nineveh. But like so many of us in the world today, so many in the church today, we're asleep. We're down in the hole of the ship, sleeping. 
We're relaxed. Verse 6. I love this. Look at verse 6 that we started off with. This is such a wonderful verse. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you, you sleeper? I love, and, and, and people don't get it. When I pick on Herb about the King James, it's because of our society. Peggy's sitting back there. Peggy knows. She taught school for a long time. Our society, the King James Bible, is written on a just above a 12th grade level. Our society cannot read it today. That's why I don't hold to the King James. But the King James sometimes is such a beautiful book. And if we knew our own language and we understand what was put before us, how beautiful it would be. And in the King James, listen to what the captain says. What meanest thou, O sleeper? You know what he was saying to him? What ails you? <laughs> what ails you? What's wrong with you, you egghead? You old fart? <laughs> what, 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 what's wrong with you? I love the Holy King. What meanest thou? What's your purpose sleeping when we're in the middle of this stupid storm? A bag of grain should fall on your head while you're laying up in it or something. I mean, what meanest thou, old sleeper? I remember a man who used to criticize his son-in-law by saying, you must have an awful conscience if you can't sleep in church. <laughs> Something bothering you when the preacher's preaching? Yeah, you can just get to church. Nothing bothers me, I'll go to sleep. If your conscience is that bad, you can't sleep in church, the father-in-law thought, man, you're pretty bad off. Here we have a picture of a man who's just said no to God. We looked at it last week, but think about this. He said no to God and finds the audacity to close his eyes in the midst of a storm on a raging sea. Is that not an act of defiance? Is that not a, 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 an act of... I, I don't know how, to, how, how it's lunacy. And we're, we're going to look why that is so important because even the world sometimes sees it. And we in the church sometimes are, are not listening. We're not, our hearing is deaf to what the world is crying out for, for answers, and we're sleeping down in the hole of a ship. Jonah could not see that deep within the terror of the storm, God's mercy was at work. He couldn't see it. Drawing him back to change his heart. Buddy, you think you're going somewhere? Back here. Get back here. My, one of my teachers used to say to me, if he'd call you, yes, Mr. So-and-so. He says, come here. Here is here. There is there. I want you here. Joe is trying to run. And God's saying, there is there, but I want you here. Get back here. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, and I pray that you do in your Bible study and your prayers and your reading, where is here for me, Lord? Where is here? And there's a parallel. If you read this scripture, when I was reading it, if you were reading along, I, I hope you see it. I hope it, it hit you the way it did me. Uh, we don't even see this, but in Mark 4.41, listen to the words in Mark 4.41. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? There's a parallel here about Jesus sleeping in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. But the parallel has a difference to it that we don't see in Jonah. Here we have the Lord sleeping in the boat. Confident because he saw him. We got Jonah who's running away from God and sleeping in the boat. And the only cure for Jonah is to get thrown over the side. And when he gets thrown over the side, what happens? The storm stops. When they wake up Jesus, what's happened? 
Jesus rebukes the wind and the wave. And, and I, I, since I was a little boy, I've loved that verse in, in Mark. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Can you imagine riding in the boat? Can you imagine that day? You're, 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 you're muckled on to the side of the gunnels there. And you're, you're holding on to something and, and, and the boat's rocking. By the way, for a Jew, you've got to know this culturally. For a Jew, they were really afraid of the abyss, the deep. The water scares the life out of them. So these guys were really brave guys. Fishermen were really brave men. They were the, the truck drivers or whatever. They were the tough guys at the time, you know? So they were afraid of it. Can you imagine being out on that water and the storm comes up? I, I'd be afraid. I wanted to go in the Navy and I didn't go. And, and I've talked to guys in my life ever since and I'm glad I went in the Army. Because I, I, I wouldn't want to see a 75 foot seawall the size of a conning tower on an aircraft carrier coming at you and rolling a, 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 a ship as big as a city. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey? They were afraid. They were amazed. So here's this conversation. What are we going to do with you? What are we, if you're the guy and they, they drew the lots, let's get the lots out. Did you ever hear that expression? I, when I was a kid working in the store as a kid, I was sweeping the store and the boss said to me, you're a Jonah. A Jonah? What's a Jonah? You know, because I, I didn't, have, I didn't, I wasn't taught, I'm learning, you know, as a kid and I'd mess something up or I'd put something in the wrong place or I'd forget something he told me and he'd always he look at me, you're a Jonah. And I didn't know what that meant. Yeah, I, I never was in the belly of a whale. I'd never been on a boat in a storm, you know. I didn't know he meant, you're the guy the lock falls on. There's always a problem, you know. And I was only 12 or 13, whatever I was. You're a Jonah. Anybody ever tell you that? Hopefully not. But they drew lots and the lot fell on Jonah. But, but what's really curious to me is in this storm, we see that in the heart of darkness and rough seas, God's work is not only in trying to bring Jonah back, not trying, but doing it, but also bringing about forgiveness. God's working in bringing about forgiveness. Has there been a time when the light of the gospel and God's promises brought you through a storm? Has there been a problem in your life where, where the seas were high and the waves rocked you and you didn't know what was going to happen? In God's Word, a Bible verse, a prayer from another saint, a vote of confidence, maybe just a phone call or a note. Reminding of you, reminding you of God's mercy and His love and lifting you up. You see, I don't care what you say, I know there's mercy deep inside our storms. And God's showing mercy to Jonah here, even though he's asleep to the things of God right now. Sometimes some of us are asleep, and I know people just t today that are asleep. I know people that are part of our church that are sleeping. God's trying to get their attention, trying to work with them. And I pray that they allow Him to do that. That they work out their salvation with fear and trembling. The second thought I want to talk about is checking our eyesight. Verse 7 says, finding, well, let's look at verse 7 real quick. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and it fell on, on Jonah. Finding that the storm was still violent, the crew comes to the conclusion that it is sent by heaven. Now, I, I want to remind you of something here, because this is gonna, you're going to see this play out. That even though these are pagans, these are heathens, there is a thing that they understand about the people that are called the Hebrews of the nation of Israel, that the God they worship, and many of them call them God with no name, 
The God they worship, they believe to be the universal God. They don't worship Him. They don't know Him. They don't have anything to do with Him. But because of the way stories go down through time and people pass word of mouth, there's enough stories about the Jews. The Jews have a pretty awesome God if, if, if He's God. If He's God, they got a pretty... You know? So, they got these lots cast and, and, and it falls on him. And look at verse 8. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. And, and I like what develops here. This, is a, this whole development is interesting. They ask him the questions, who are you? Who are you? What would you say if someone said to you, who are you? What would your response be? How would you identify yourself to someone else? Would you say, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm Irish, I'm Italian, I'm whatever. How do you identify who you are? See, Jonah had, doubtless had a, a lot of time to um, comply with the captain's request when he said, hey, hey, Goofy, you're sleeping. You need to get up and pray. Pray to your God. And, and now the, the, the lots have been pulled and, and, and he gets it and they know that there's something here. And because they believe that once he identifies himself as a Hebrew. By the way, you notice he didn't say Israelite? He didn't say I'm from Israel or I'm an Israelite. He said I'm a Hebrew. He identified himself directly. That was a direct identification with the God of the universe in the Hebrew mind, and in the stories of the realm. But what would you say? Who would you say? Would you just say, I'm an electrician, I'm a carpenter, I'm a state representative? I mean, what? Would someone, would you say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ? How many of you would say, first thing out of your lips, I'm a believer in Christ? I don't think I've ever ran into anybody that would. Who are you? Well, I'm a believer in Christ. I've never run into anybody who would say that. Some of them would brag about something else. I live in Waltham or Mariahville or some other far flung place like that. You know. Do you ever think about that? When someone says, Who are you? And here, what, what's he say? Verse 9, and he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And, and look how he follows it up. I fear the Lord. The Lord. He didn't say the Lord God of it all. The Lord. So he's already identified him. I, I fear him. I don't know, John, from what we've seen so far, how much do you fear him? You, got, you went the other direction, you got on a boat going as far as you could in the other direction, and you go down and you fall. You must have had a pretty, you know, awful conscience, right? If you couldn't fall asleep in the hole of a ship going to Tarshish. I don't know, it's a funny thing here. And, and then he goes on to say, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. How does he identify the Lord? He's the God of the universe. In other words, I believe in the God. There are no others. This is the supreme God. He is Yahweh. He is the God I worship. So if someone stops you and says to you, all right, who are you? Well, um, uh, and if you want to get religious, I belong, I belong to the Clifton Baptist Church. What's that mean? Do you see how he identified himself here? I am a Hebrew and I believe in the Lord. The God who made everything, the land and the sea. He didn't just identify it casually. There was not just a little veneer here. He gave him everything. I believe in the God eternal. In fact, in verse 8, the mariners having, as they suppose, discovered the culprit, proceed that calamity, or this calamity has fallen upon them, 
to kind of just, you know, okay, let's just check this out to investigate and for whose cause. And some manuscripts, that's what was said, for whose cause is this? In, the, in some of the original manuscripts of the Hebrew and Greek omit this clause as unnecessary, but there's a commentator I like very much, Kyle, and he remarks, it's not above board to say this, the sailors thereby are wishing to induce Jonah to confess his guilt with his own mouth. So when they ask him, who are you? Now that the, the lots have fallen, we know it's you. Who are you? And they want him to tell them. And in their excitement, they crowd the question upon question, asking him about his business, his, you know, uh, uh, his journey, his country, his parentage. They said, who are you, buddy? Dare we ask ourselves that question in our Christian walk? If you're a believer in Christ, if you're a disciple in Christ, do you ask yourself that question, who am I? Do I believe that Jesus is the Christ? So in verse 9, he says, I am a Hebrew. If someone was to ask you who you were, again, what would your reply be? In verse 10, he had already told them, by the way, he says that in verse 9. So in verse 10, as he continues on, he says, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And he said, you know, I believe in God and I believe in the God who's created all things. I believe him. And I'm, I'm fleeing him. And these guys are like, really? So I'm going to give you an idea of how this might sound in, in modern parlance and not with God. So if you've got a guy looking for you in New York City and he's in the Mafia or Boston or, or Chicago or Miami where all those big crime centers are, and, and all of a sudden a guy shows up at your whatever, you got a little store that's hanging out or a restaurant and you, you're trying to move the guy along so the waitress can get another, somebody at the table get some more tip and, and realize all of a sudden Sir, can I help you? Listen, I gotta sit here. He said, the mafia is sitting outside and, and they're looking for me. I've seen enough movies. I've lived in Brooklyn. I, I don't know if guys are gonna come in with a gun or a machine gun. I've seen The Godfather 19 times. I, I know, I don't want the guy there. I don't want him sitting in my place. I don't want him, and, and, not because I have anything to do with the Mafia. I know what they're like. Now take and juxtapose this against something good and great like God, and this guy says, I'm fleeing God. So I'm hanging out on your boat, going the other way. And the verse 10, you're saying, why'd you bring this on us? Why'd you involve, what did we do we didn't know you before that you decided to get on our boat? Why have we been privileged with your presence? Why are we so graced by your stay with us today? And, and, I, and I think this is sometimes crazy. He told them earlier that he was fleeing from his God and that he had not, it didn't concern them. Yeah, it does to them because they're in this storm. And his, it's his problem and well, what are we going to do about it? So, as Christians, sometimes we look at the world and we look at the situations people get in and if we have an opportunity to help them, do we? See, Jonah has a chance here to help them. And he comes clean, doesn't he? He comes honest. And, and, and what's he say here? He said in verse 12, if you pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. If, if you have a chance to help somebody, do we do it? Sometimes in our witnessing, I wonder why we're afraid. Because these people that need to hear the message of Christ need to hear it from us. Because that's what 
God has ordained. And we have the responsibility of telling people. I mentioned that last week when we looked again back to some of my favorite verses, Ezekiel 33 uh, and 33 and 34 of chapter 33. So how does the world hear us? That's what I want to think about for a moment. How does the world hear us? Has the church been silent? How has the world perceived our message? And in the world today, with so much confusion going on, churches are judged by what sign they put out front. Or what flag, multicolored flag they're waving. Or whether they say on the sign, we are opening and affirming and, and welcoming and affirming. Or God still speaks. Stuff that go against Scripture. What kind of message are we sending to the world? What kind of message was Jonah sending to the world of those sailors who had him on the boat? Because they feared instantly when they realized that he's a Hebrew and he's running from his God. The God of the universe. The God that made everything. They were afraid. What do you think they're thinking about you, Jonah? So when we put stuff into our lives that have nothing but animosity towards God's Word, when it goes against God's Word, what do you think the world's thinking? So often, I, I, I look at young people and, well, there's just so much confusion about that. Why? Are you willing to sit down? Let's look at the Word. Let's share the Scriptures. It's hard to get somebody to sit and want to read Scripture with you. Let me share a verse with you. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me remind you of a few things. That's why I ask you to check your hearing. Are we hearing how the world's talking about us? Or are we not hearing anything because we're asleep down in the hole of the ship like Jonah was? Are they listening to us at all? Maybe it's our approach. Maybe it is the dread of the subject and the response you may receive from somebody when you want to tell them about Christ. Sharing your faith is one of the keys to spiritual health. Paul Little in his book, I love this, How to Give Away Your Faith, calls it the fizz in the Pepsi of the Christian life. He calls sharing your faith the fizz in the Pepsi of sharing the Christian life. Because, he says, it puts sparkle and verve into your faith. When we tell others about Jesus Christ, it makes us study the Word so that our eyes are now sharpened and we sharpen our ability to communicate its message. If you have the, uh, the opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus, some of you, you know, in the church, who are the best Bible students in the church? The pastor and the, the Sunday school teachers. Because they're preparing all the time for the message on Sunday morning and the Sunday school lesson or whatever, Bible studies, whatever you're involved in. Who's ever leading that? Those are your best Bible teachers because they keep going to the Word to sharpen their skills. I want to tell them nothing wrong. I want to tell them something's right. So I want to go. I'll tell you what got me into ministry years and years ago. Scott Records, my brother-in-law, was pastoring down in Bar Harbor. He hadn't been here that long. And each pastor was called on that was willing and able to run a week at camp, at Baptist Youth Camp. It, it ran totally different in, than it has in the last 25 years back then. He says, come on down from Presque Isle when you have a week of vacation and I want you to be a counselor. The Lord was working in my life. There was a lot of things going on and I was worship leading at Presque Isle at Bethany. And I love camp. <laughs> the more I tried to argue, I couldn't. And I, I remember coming down and I was a counselor and then the bones that hurt today were starting then. And I said, nah, I, no, I don't. Yeah, all right. And I went to camp. I remember that first night. And it was a wonderful camp. I had one kid show up with green hair. 
and another kid show up with spike hair. And all they kept talking about was the two girls that they were going to try to hide some in and suck face with down there and give them a kiss. <laughs> so I said, look at the boys I got in this cabin I got to deal with. And I remember the first night, whatever was said in chapel made Steve's boys think. And we're sitting here in the bunk in the cabin, and they asked some good questions. And I felt, I felt Ill, Ill prepared. I said, John, you need to get your act together. This is serious business. And you need to get your act together. You need to sharpen your skills. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest minds given to the church, in the last 2,000 years. One of the most brilliant people as far as writing goes. He said, when you want to convert a person to your view, you go over to where he is standing, take him by the hand, and guide him. You don't stand across the room and shout at him, hey, come over here. God, I want you to believe in Jesus. Come on. I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Get over here. You, you don't do that, Thomas says. You don't order him to come over where you are. Hey, here. There is there. Here is here. Here. I want you to come over so I can tell you about Jesus. You don't do that. You start where he is. You start where he is and work from that position. He said that's the only way to get people to budge. If you go and start giving people a, a, a list of rules and regulations and, and this is what it means to believe in Christ and, and this is what you got to do and you got to do this and next thing you know they're, they're thinking they're joining the Masons. They're joining some other club or something. They're, they're joining something else. It's not about that. It's about reaching the heart. Jonah forgot that. Jonah wasn't listening to God because it was about Nineveh. And it was about rescuing people that needed to hear the message. Jonah forgot it. The second thing mentioned, as I mentioned, your eyesight, is, I'm already hearing, is your eyesight. How does the world see us in our daily walk? How does the world see the church today? Gandhi, Gandhi refused to become a Christian. Mahatma Gandhi. Why? Because he knew so many of them and how they lived. They say they do one thing, but I see them do something else. Will Rogers, if you remember Will Rogers, I know Vern does. I think they went to high school together. Will Rogers once said that you need to live like you wouldn't be ashamed to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. Our lives need to be open as believers. Our lives need to be clear as believers. Not hiding things, not putting things away. So this morning, and I'm getting ready to close because Dave will get to start on time today. Many of us are familiar with the Miranda Act, which instructs all police officers to give the arrested party a review of their rights as a United States citizen. Often we hear these famous lines on TV or in the movies or something. Um, the one most of us can remember the best is you have the right to remain silent. Anything you can say will be used against you in a court of law. And the first time you hear these words spoken in person, you realize the gravity of the situation. <laughs> Correct? In a somewhat different way, the believer is asked, 
a different sort of questions by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We are questioned about our faith and our trust in God for our eternal salvation on a daily basis by the world. The world's watching, folks, how we live. And we are commanded to witness for the Lord in His Word. As a recent songwriter wrote, you don't have the right to remain silent if you've been arrested by God's grace. Get that? You don't have the right to be silent or remain silent if you've been arrested by God's grace. The truth is that we are commanded in the Bible that we do not have the right to remain silent about our faith. Christians are called to tell the world about Christ's death, resurrection, and His saving power. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh. And when we go, we are to tell of how we have been pardoned for our sins, according to 1 Peter 3, 5. How can we then be silent about the joy of knowing Christ? I'll tell you. By sharing Him with somebody each day. So this morning, as we close, if those sailors found you in the bottom of the boat, on the road or on the waves to Tarshish, what would have been the outcome? If you were there instead of Jonah, where are you sharing your faith these days? What I'm asking you is, where is your Nineveh? And how do you identify yourself when someone asks you, who are you? You identify yourself as a follower of the land, someone who is following Jesus Christ. Think about those things for us today and for me, I pray. In Jesus' name, let's go and pray now. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for, again, your word. Father, we know that you took care of Jonah. And you've allowed Jonah's life to be an example to us. I pray that we would be faithful to your word and that wherever our Nineveh may be, wherever you say to us, go, we would go. Or when you say to us, whom shall I send, we would say, send me. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. As we close this morning, let's turn in our hymnals to number 456. Find us faithful. We we'll stand and sing together. faithful to you and your word as we found those who went before us faithful. And may those again who come behind us say that we were faithful. Father, let us hold to your word, we pray. Now give us grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May the grace of God, that wonderful, marvelous grace of God, 
fall upon every child of God and bring me unsaved unto Jesus Christ until our Lord shall come. Amen. Amen.